I mentioned this already that um, oftentimes when you are having discussions on politics or religion, they end up being very divisive. And that's one of the reasons that people say don't talk about those things. But as we look at this passage today, context is everything. And that's why I actually do expository preaching because every sermon is set up by the sermons that have come before it in a book. Again, Paul has spent 11 chapters of the book of Romans talking about foundational truths that govern every portion of our lives. And mainly it's about salvation and how we are in a right relationship with God. Not because of anything we have done, but because of what he did for us when Jesus came and died on the cross for us. And so as we look at this section of Romans starting in chapter 12 and we're in 13 today, we're really answering a question that Paul poses here, and that is, because we've received God's mercy, how should we live as Christians? How do I live now that I've received this? Now he gives two verses, the very first two verses of Romans 12, really does the general tenure of everything he's gonna say here in these passages. And everything builds off of that. Because Paul first challenged us personally. And he says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior or the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So Paul, first of all, pleads with us, and again, he's begging here, to make your body a living sacrifice for God and to change the way you think from the way the world thinks to the way that God wants us to think. And this is God's wonderful fulfilling plan for you and me if we will follow it. Now he expounds upon this throughout the next four chapters. And the very first thing he addressed after this was who we are in relationship to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And primarily our function in the church. Every one of us have been given gifts that we are to use to build up the body of Christ. That's what they're for. And when we're not functioning in those gifts, the church hurts. I mentioned before, when we look at uh, our bodies, our physical bodies, what's the most important part? It's the one that's not working. And so when we think of the church, if we are not functioning in our gift and we're fully fulfilling the purpose we have individually for the church, the church suffers. And I think that's a big issue in America today is that there are few of the gifts actually functioning in the church. But it's how we live within the church and we love one another. And that's the other portion of that. How do we treat one another as Christians? And we cannot know what the needs are and how we treat one another if we don't even know each other. Unfortunately, in the last two years, many people have moved to a uh, virtual church where they watch a sermon online and that's good enough. That's not church. We did it for three months here because it was necessary, because we had to close the church because of the pandemic, because we were following government regulations, which we're going to talk about today. But after that, there's a lot of people that never came back. And the fact is that that's not church. Watching a preacher online is not church. Because we need relationship. We need each other. Then Paul challenged us on how we were to treat those outside the church. 
How do we interact with individuals in our community? And specifically, he talks about how we deal with those that are enemies and have injured us. Paul is very clear that we are never to take revenge on our enemies. Personal retribution is always forbidden for a Christian. That's hard for us to swallow, but that's what he teaches. Instead, we are to love our enemies, pray blessings on them, and do good to them. And by doing this, this is that transformed thinking and sacrificial life that people will see and we will shine as bright lights in the dark world that we live in. Paul summarized this teaching in the last verse that we looked at last week in chapter 12 where he says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And so, flip to the next slide. I should have seen. We have got the wrong slides in there, Nicholas. Oops. So download the other slides. I, I may have put the wrong one in there. Okay, thank you. But don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And so what Paul is challenging us with is not to be overcome by evil by taking revenge on those who've injured us. And so he's challenging us not to allow that to happen. But he also understands this. And this sets up today's sermon. A lot of people say, what is the context, after you've dealt with this, of the government? Paul understands that if evil goes unchecked, if there is no justice, if there is no retribution, then evil wins the day in this world. We see that when our anarchy goes on. Where there is no government, it is murder and anything goes. And so God understood this, and so he established government to deal with punishing the wicked and protecting the innocent. And that's a context of this passage that we'll be looking at today. And that is that everyone in verse 1 of chapter 13, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. And so he starts off and moves throughout this passage from personal sanctification to how we act within the church, how we act in our community, and now that relationship, that tenuous relationship that Christians have with government. Because we are citizens of two kingdoms, are we not? We're a citizen of God's kingdom, and we're also citizens of the kingdom we live in. And for us, that's America. How are we to interact with that kingdom? And it's very important. So God instituted three major institutions. You know what they are? First one's marriage, the home. God instituted that for society, to govern society, and it's crucial. And we see the breakdown of that in our generation, which has caused so many problems in our generation and in our country. The second one is government. God instituted government from the very beginning. And because there was a breakdown in government, and there has been a breakdown in government, you see chaos. And the third one is the church. And the church and the government have two very distinct roles. The government is there to have physical protection of people. The church is there for the moral and spiritual protection of people. And when you confuse those, you end up having government with overreach or the church with overreach. There have been times in the church history when there have been those that have tried to set up a theodicy. You know what a theodicy is? That's when God rules. You saw that uh, with Zwingli. He tried to do that. Calvin and Zwingli did in Switzerland. It didn't work well. And any time you try to govern people and force them 
into moral behavior, you will have chaos. That is not the role of the church, of forcing them. The government is responsible for keeping the peace. And when there is good government with good laws, you have a safe place for living, and the gospel is able to thrive there when the church doesn't overstep that. And so that is very important for us to understand that. And again, we see even in our country where there had been confusion where the government will overstep its boundaries and the church will overstep its boundaries. And we need to keep the whim together. And when they both work well together, you have harmony. So how do we live as Christians in the world? Well, first of all, Paul is challenging the church in Rome to submit to the Roman government. That was a government that was ruled by Nero. And I, let, I want us to remember that. Nero was an evil, ruthless man. And he eventually killed both Paul and Peter. That's the government that Paul is challenging the Christians to submit to. But they will not submit to that government until they become living sacrifices. Going back to verse 1 of chapter 12, if we become living sacrifices, in essence, what we have done is you must consider yourself already dead. And a lot of the Roman Christians will become dead. You see, we become dead to our wants, our desires, and our living, and our lives. We struggle with submission to government, don't we? Especially if it's not doing what we believe is the right thing. And as Americans, we feel like we control government because we get to elect those who are ruling. And I want to say this. I believe every Christian who's eligible to vote has a God-given responsibility to vote because of the form of government we have. We have that responsibility. And I also believe that Christians need to be involved in the political process. And some of us are called to serve in that process. Jim is on the school board, and I am so glad he's on our school board, to give that balanced, godly approach to there. Jeremy Schultz serves on our town board. And these are important places. And we need to be involved in the political process. And unfortunately, because it's a nasty process, many Christians have run away from it. But we need godly leadership in our government. And I think that's part of the reason we're in the mess we're in now. Because many Christians have shirked their responsibility to be civil leaders. But we under need to understand this. Government will only have a limited impact on our lives. Government only can do so much. Many people in our society have made government an idol, and they expect the government to do what only God can do. A lot of other people in our society want the government to do for them what they should be doing for themselves. And you see both of those in our society. But we need to understand that government and what God has intended government to do cannot do all those things. And so the first principle we need to understand dealing with the government is we need to have a realistic expectation of what, God, what government can accomplish. We need to have realistic expectations. And unfortunately, I think that we have it out of balance so many times. And I think it's partly fueled by politicians. We allow politicians to get up and make all these wonderful promises for us. If you will elect me, you will live in utopia. And people will follow that, and when they get in office, nothing changes. And we need to be careful about that. I was privileged to go to the Chamber of Commerce meeting on Wednesday morning, and Blake, uh, Brad Blake and Jack Turner both spoke at the chamber meeting. They're running for county commissioner along with Clyde Church, and he couldn't be there because he was at a meeting. But what I appreciated about both of those men is they didn't make promises. They said, these are the issues that we need to tackle. 
We need affordable housing in La Plata County. We need to deal with land use codes. We need to deal with a lot of these issues. You know, they talked about the whole issue of Purple Cliffs that has been in the news. And they didn't say we have the solution, but they did say these are things we need to work on. And the other part I appreciated about them, they didn't uh, badmouth either one of each other. They were both in the same room, which was nice. But they didn't badmouth Clyde Church either, who wasn't there. And I appreciated that civility that needs to return to our politics. I am so looking forward to the commercials being over. You know, most of the time we tape whatever we're watching on TV, so I skip them. But I am sick of the bad mouthing, and it's been going on almost for a generation. And it's horrendous because we vilify other people, which is God not, God, it is not God's way. But here's the principle. Regardless who is elected into office this year, we are to submit to them. And that's what the second part of this verse tells us. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. You cast a vote, but guess what? Who puts that person in office? See, we have a hard time with that in America. God is the one that placed them there, not you and me. And that's why we need to be very prayerful about who we vote for. Who is God desired to put in that office for this time and for this purpose? God is the one that established government. Last week I talked about this as well, and we spent several weeks talking about the sovereignty of God. We will not accept this teaching if we have not accept the sovereignty of God. God controls kings and all those in authority. Daniel speaks to this, and I want to look at a couple of verses from Daniel. First of all, when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream and he was going to kill all the wise men, including Daniel and his friends, you remember that? Daniel went and prayed and God revealed to him the dream. And this is what he said. Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. See, Daniel understood. Now again, at this point, Nebuchadnezzar was an evil king ready to kill every person in leadership in his government because they couldn't tell him what his dream was in the interpretation. That's a little outrageous, don't you think? But Daniel understood God's the one to put him there. And then Daniel approached Nebuchadnezzar later in that chapter, and look what he tells Nebuchadnezzar. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings. And at that point in time in history, it was true. He was the greatest of all kings in the world. But look what he says. The God of, Ge the God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. You didn't get this on your own. He made you the ruler of all over the inhabited world. He did this. You didn't do it. You see, Daniel did not fear Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar could have lopped his head off right there. He did not fear him, but he respected and honored him in his position, and he submitted to the authority of that king. He did not start off by going in there and saying, you know that decree you made to kill all the wise men? That was really stupid. How well would it have gone for Daniel at that point? You see, he was wise and honorable and respectful of the king. And because of that, the king honored Daniel and put him in charge of his kingdom. But see, we are to submit to those in charge. And this includes those like Nero, who was ruling when Paul wrote this. So how is it possible that evil, evil rulers are placed in authority by God? And why would God want us to submit to them? These are very difficult questions, and I'm not 
hear it, and I don't have an answer to all of it. We're going to talk about it some. But here's what I do know. If you look throughout history, the gospel has flourished and accomplished its purposes many times in a much greater way from prison cells and from martyrs' deaths than it has from comfortable churches with religious freedom, i.e. America today. The church is suffering under religious freedom. But if you go in many places of the world where the church is outlawed and forbidden and where Christians are put in jail and martyred, the church is thriving. I don't say that is the reality that we need to expect, and that's the answer to the question. But that is something we need to do. But here's the overriding principle, and it's this. When I submit to the governing authorities, I am submitting myself to God. Again, I deal with men in jail and do Bible studies with them and do Celebrate Recovery and I've had a lot of men over the years tell me, I'll submit to God, but I am not submitting to that officer. And you know what my response is? You aren't submitting to God then. And the thing is, it's not whether that officer is good or right and fair, but because he's wearing the uniform. And that's my attitude when I go in the jail as well. Over the years... I have gone into jail and many times I will encounter somebody who is adversarial towards me even when I was the chaplain. And you know what? Whatever they told me to do, I did it. And if I had an issue with it and I had to deal with it, I would go to their superior and deal with it. I would not argue with that officer. Because the thing is, he has the uniform. I'm a guest in there. But God wants to understand that when we're submitting to them, we are submitting to God's ultimate authority over them. He goes on and states this next in verse 2. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. We need to understand this. When we rebel against the authorities, we should expect to be punished. Again, we tend to struggle with this. We, even when it's merely an inconvenience. We don't like to be pulled over by a police officer who gives us a speeding ticket. And we don't want somebody to tell us to wear a mask when we go into the hospital. We don't like those things. I mean, the outrage of America over the issue of mask. Really? You know, but that is the problem that we have submitting to authority. But there are real issues and life-threatening situations for Christians, and they faced it throughout history, and they face it today in many totalitarian governments that persecute the church. And how they handle that situation is very important. But here's the question. Are there limits to our submission to earthly authority? Yes. And that's when that earthly authority commands that we disobey God and sin in order to obey them. This took place in Rome when they made Caesar a god and you had to declare Caesar as Lord, make him out to, god, to be a god. Many Christians refused and they died. And again, you see that happening. It's also when we saw things like in Nazi Germany as one example where Nazi Germany overstepped any moral boundaries and were committing genocide on the Jews. And again, that was a situation that should have been resisted by the citizenry and everybody in the world. And unfortunately, for the most part, the church was silent in that situation. And so there is a time that there you oppose a government. In America, I'm going to give just one example, but with the Civil Rights Movement, there were clearly laws on the books that needed to be changed, and Martin Luther King led a peaceful demonstration against those racial laws. 
And there were men like Billy Graham, and I don't know if you knew this, but Billy Graham stood next to him. He refused to do a crusade in Atlanta, Georgia, because they had segregated it. He went in there and tore down those lines and said, I will not come. And he stood next to Dr. Martin Luther King. But they did it respectfully. They did it peacefully. They did it in a way that did not, was, was not subversive to the government. And as a result, they were able to help change the laws. What about today? We live in a very changing time where sinful behavior that the Bible clearly forbids is advocated and supported through legislation. However, and this is a big however, as Christians, we don't have to practice those behaviors. And as far as I know, there's not one law on the books in America right now that I have to disobey in order to be a Christian. Now, there are times where they're encroached. One of our CYA missionaries, uh, her father is the man who did the cake decorating in the cake place in, up in northern Colorado that won a Supreme Court battle, and now he's in it again. They, they basically have told him, the opponents, we are going to harass you the rest of your life. And they will bring one lawsuit after another against him. That's unfortunate. But that's an isolated case. Now, it may not be an isolated case soon. But here's what we must do. We must have wisdom in how we address these issues in our country. Paul goes on to speak to this in the next two verses. Look at what he says in verse 3. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing wrong. But in those who are doing, they do not strike fear in people who are doing what's right. But in those that are doing wrong, would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right and they will honor you. Now again, Paul is dealing here with general government principles. Is this always true? No. But what Paul is really addressing here is not your criminal element. And I think that's important. Who is he speaking to? The church. And he's dealing with those who are subversive against the government and are involved in revolutionary activity against the state. I want to return to Nazi Germany for a minute. Though most Christians in Germany did nothing, during the Holocaust, there were those that did stand up. One of them was Diedrich Bonhoeffer. How many of you have heard of Diedrich Bonhoeffer? He was a pastor who actually became involved with assassination attempts on Hitler. They were unsuccessful. He was arrested and he was assassinated. But here's the question. Did Diedrich Bonhoeffer fear the government? Now, if you read his prison letters, he had no regrets for what he did. And he did not fear Nazi Germany. Matter of fact, he didn't even acknowledge him as a legitimate government. You see, the issue is that of fear. And the point is, if and when we have to, and I'm going to put a big if to start with there, if you have to stand against governing authorities, Several things need to be in place. First of all, we need to have a clear understanding that this is against God and this is what God wants me to do. Because if I do that, then I don't have to fear what will happen to me. And you see that throughout history. And you see it even now with those that are being martyred and imprisoned. They don't fear the government. God gives them the grace to deal with it. But here, and I think this is important, that this passage is not dealing with the extremes. What Paul is dealing with is government in general, where the law is for the most part just and right. And the 
government affords protection for those that are being governed. And again, this is confirmed in the next two verses. Look at verse 4. The authorities are God's servants. Now, I want to stop there for just a minute. The word servant there is doulos. The same word we get diaconus from, deacon, in the church. It's the same word Paul uses of himself as a servant. See, governing authorities are God's servants sent for our good. But if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who are wrong, who do what is wrong. See, we need to realize that God, again, has instituted government and it's to protect innocent lives and punish those who are criminals. Without good government, there is lawlessness. And again, overall, the Roman government made the world safer. Under the Roman peace, you've heard of the, the Roman Pax, they had a peaceful world where it was safer to travel the roads, and that the gospel was able to go forward in a real way, and lives were better for people in general under the Roman rule than they were from many of the countries they had conquered. And I just want to challenge us. Most of the laws that we have in our country are good, and the governing authorities make society safer and better for us as a people. And we live still under the best form of government the world has as Americans. And we often forget that privilege we have. And there are those within our country that would like to overthrow that and take it into anarchy. And as a church, we can't be a part of that. I read an article the other day, and it's an important article is how is the church going to stand in these times? We are not to be revolutionaries. We are to be change agents. And I've talked about how that is. We need to be involved in the political process. We need to be involved in politics. But we need to do it in such a way that we are not considered dangerous. I mentioned last week, there are elements in our country that see the church as dangerous, and there are those who call themselves Christians that verify that. And that's not God's way, and Paul is very clear that is not God's way and how we're to do this. In the previous chapter, Paul had talked about never taking revenge on your enemy. But what God has done is instituted government to do that. But not take revenge, but to mete out justice on that. See, our motive would be revenge. The government's motive should be justice. And he calls them God's servants. And they are to do this. And those include police officers and soldiers and legislators, and civil servants, and tax collectors, and others who are appointed or elected. These are God's servants, and they're there for our good. And God has instituted government to give righteous standards for a safer society. This is spoken throughout Proverbs, and I'm going to give you just one verse in Proverbs that speaks to it. Look what he says. Because of me... God is speaking. Kings reign and rulers make just decrees. Because of me, the kings reign and rulers make just decrees. Are there evil police officers and soldiers and legislators who do bad and judges who do harm? Yeah. But that's also true in the church, isn't it? There are evil pastors. 
There are wolves that sneak their way in and do destruction in the church. But because there are evil those out there does not mean the whole system is corrupt. And we need to understand that. But overall, we need to understand that God has instituted government to protect people and punish evildoers in the world. God's instituted us for that purpose. Next slide. That's what government's for. Now, government in our society does a lot more. And you can debate whether that's good or bad. Everything from Social Security to building roads and bridges to having schools that are government run. You can argue any way you want on that. But the primary purpose of government is to protect the people and punish the evildoers. That is the primary purpose. It's why we have a military. It's to protect us from foreign enemies. It's why we have police. <coughs> to protect us from domestic enemies and for us as individuals. Paul concludes his exhortation about submitting to the governing authorities in the last verse in this passage. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Fear of retribution should never be the deterrent for a Christian submitting to governing authorities. I don't submit out of fear of retribution. Of course, I've spent 22 years in jail. I'd probably be okay in there. Some of the rest of you might not be. But why do I submit to governing authorities? It's out of conscience. You see... The bigger issue that Paul's addressing here for us in the church is conscience. And I want to repeat what we looked at last chapter when Paul said this in chapter 12. He said, do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can do to live at peace with everyone. See, it's about my integrity and my reputation. And it's about your reputation and your integrity and how we are viewed as a church in the community. I'm going to go back to the time when we shut down the church or when we first opened back up and started wearing masks. Do you know why we did that? It wasn't because of our governor. It was because of our police chief and our mayor and the Southern Ute Tribe, all of these entities locally here that we have a reputation to uphold with them. And I can tell you the churches that refused, they lost their reputation with them. You see, it's about who we are and conscience and how we do that. And that is crucial and unfortunately, we've lost some of that in our day and time. At times, if we must oppose the state in order for us to submit to Christ and obey God, we must do it in a way that's still respectful. We see this with Jesus when he stood before Pilate. As Jesus stood before Pilate over and over again, Pilate wanted to release him. Because Jesus respect, you see this with Paul in the same way. Paul, when he stood before Jewish rulers or Roman rulers, always showed respect, even if they opposed him. Peter tells this, which is a sister passage to what Paul says. Look what Peter says. By the way, this was written later than Paul, getting even closer to the time that Paul and Peter would be killed. Submit yourselves to the Lord's sake to every institution, whether to a king on the one as the one in authority or to the governors as sent by him to punish the evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, 
that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish people. Do we need to silence the ignorance of foolish people today about the church? Yeah. How do we do that? Defending our rights? Really? That's not what Paul says. It's not what Peter says. Act as free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. You see, because of the freedom I have in Christ, I don't have to defend my rights. Think about that for a minute. Because who we are, and we serve a kingdom much greater than any kingdom on this earth, I don't have to defend my rights. Now, there may be a time I can, and Paul did that. He used his Roman citizenship on multiple occasions. But again, even when he did it, how did he do it? Respectfully. He did it in such a way that it shut up the foolish people that were speaking. Having a clear conscience means we are first submitted to Christ in everything. And then we're submitted to those he's placed in authority in the world. If we do this, we do not have to fear government. Paul, in the last two verses of this passage, now gives us a very practical application to this, which we all love. Look at verse 6. Pay your taxes. I had a meeting with my CPA on Friday. I don't get to pay my taxes till October 15th every year because that's the way it works out and that's the last date you can file and do it late. Pay your taxes for the same reasons. What reasons? To shut up foolish people, to have the respect of the authorities. Again, I know people who claim to be Christians who don't pay taxes or they don't claim all their income when they file their income taxes. But I see this as a similar issue to tithing. Am I really trusting God with my finances if I'm going to cheat the government out of money or cheat God out of money? See, that's a real issue here. There are others who won't pay taxes. They say because the government wasted. But Jesus tells us very clearly what we're to do. And remember, he is under a Roman rule that didn't benefit the Jews at all, hardly. But he said, pay your tax. Uh, he said to uh, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Jesus made a very clear distinction there for us. But see, there's another practical reason we pay our taxes. And that's what he says in the second part of this verse. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. You see that for the third time in this passage. They are servants of God. And we all understand government wastes money. How many of you would say the government's using their money the way they're supposed to? I got you. <laughs> there's a lot of waste out there. But there's also a lot of good. Every one of us in this room knows people, and there are people in this room that are paid by our government, and they do good work. I have three of my sons that work for the government. And I think they're well worth it for the government, for what they do. And many of you have family members and friends that serve in some role in the government, and our taxes are used to pay for them, both locally, on a state level, and in our federal government. And so that really doesn't hold weight when you say, I'm not going to pay my taxes because they're wasting it. Yeah, it is sometimes wasted, but there's a lot of good that comes out of it too. So any argument against not paying your taxes really doesn't hold any weight. Again, I only pay the taxes that are due me, and I take every deduction possible that's legal, 
But here's the thing. I don't have to fear about being audited. The church doesn't have to fear about being audited. They can come anytime they want. I actually had a tax man come after me and threaten to put my lien on my house because they screwed up at the IRS and did not put one of my quarterly payments in my account. That happened about 20 years ago. And you know what? I threatened them. And they got it straightened out. I did it respectfully, but I did it. But here's the thing. This is all a part of living as citizens in the world because we still live here. Paul concludes this teaching on government in verse 7 where he says this, Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. You see, he gives a general statement here which is interesting because it goes beyond the government. Give to everyone what you owe them. That has to do with not with just government debt but personal debt. And again, our reputation can be ruined as Christians because we don't pay our bills. We don't pay who we owe. That's something when we were building the church, as soon as the work was done and as soon as I got a bill, it was paid. And you know what? We have a really good reputation in our community because of that. I do that same thing personally. Matter of fact, I've had people that have worked for me that I have to hound them to give me a bill. <laughs> you know? But we need to do that because that is part of our integrity. That's part of our reputation. But the other part is pay your taxes and fees. What are the government fees? Well, it's like when you get your car registered. There's a lot of other things the government gets money for. But that's what we're supposed to do. And again, it's because of conscience and because of reputation that we do this. But he gives one final command, and I want to stop there today. Give respect and honor to those in authority. This applies to police officers, elected officials, and all those who have authority. This is showing respect and honor to the office they hold as well as to the individual that holds that office. Sometimes there are people that aren't honorable in that office, but you still respect them. I mentioned police officers a while ago. There are bad cops out there. I know that, but I am still to respect that individual because of they are in authority, because they wear the uniform. My son has served with some of those bad cops over in Montezuma County where he serves. And you know what? Some of those guys got fired, and they should have been because they were not good police officers. But as long as they wore the uniform, they were to be respected. And you see that with Paul. You see that throughout the New Testament teaching. And that's the way God intends us to do this. And one way that, one of the best ways we do this is to pray for those in authority. Rather than speak ill, and ridicule them, Paul tells us to pray for them. In, second, in 1 Timothy 2, he said this, I urge you first of all to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Pray. That's what we're to do. But here's the thing. As Christian citizens, we are to submit to the governing authorities. We are to honor the representatives. We're to pay our taxes. And we're to pray for their welfare. We are to support 
government's God-given role and participate when the opportunity allows us to do so. Because when we do this, we're being salt and light in the world which we're supposed to be. But I want to go back where I started this morning. We will not do that if we have not made our bodies living sacrifice and changed the way we think. Because I can tell you when you walk out the doors, that's not the way the world thinks, is it? It's all about what I can get out of it, and it's all about me. But as believers in Christ who are citizens of God's kingdom and citizens in this world, we are to be better than that. We are to set the example. And unfortunately, and this is an unfortunate, in, all, in many circumstances, we're just like the world, and that's what repels the world against the church. You see, our reputation is more important than most anything else we do because how we represent Christ is how the world sees Christ. And that is sacrificial. As we come to communion this morning, and if you want to go get the children out of children's church, whoever's there, I want to challenge us with our attitude towards the government. Because I know there is so much negative. But I want to also remind us that God has allowed us to be living in the freest nation in the world. And we have the best government in the world. We are a privileged people. I do not have to fear anybody coming into this building this morning and arresting me for what I've just said. And I could have twisted this sermon a whole different way and they still couldn't arrest me. See, the reality is God is sovereign over our lives and we can trust Him. And I have been asked, do you think America is going to survive? And given the state of our American government right now and the people in America, I don't know. But here's, the, here's my answer. It doesn't matter. Because what I'm called to do and what you're called to do as citizens of heaven, we do it regardless of what the government is. Because we're building a different kingdom. And we don't put our eggs in the basket of this kingdom, but God's kingdom. We are to be good citizens, go out and vote. Interesting, a month from now will be, the vote will already be cast. And whoever's been elected, the sun will come up that morning. And we need to have that perspective. So come forward and let's take communion together. I want to go back to the context of the passage of Scripture that we preached this morning. Why do you submit to the governing authorities? Because of God's mercy. If for no other reason, that's why. And we need to take it to heart. Because of what Jesus did for us, he gave up all his rights. And compared to our rights, whew, creator of the universe, lived in eternity, sat at the right hand of the Father, governed all the universe, became a baby, died a horrible death. Because of God's mercy, we are to act differently. And this is a message not just for us. It's a message for the church in America. 
Because unless we change the way we present ourselves in the world, we will not have any impact on reaching our world with the gospel. Because the world doesn't respect us, the world doesn't honor us, the world doesn't see us as a benefit. And I believe in most part it's because of our political action over the last 40 years. Because of God's mercy, we are to be different. And this is how we're to live. And it should affect all our speech. And it should affect everything we do in our lives, individually and in public. Our personal conversations should be affected by this as well. And God help us to be the church and let God handle changing the government. But we do this because of Jesus. Jesus said, this is my body. I give it for you so that your sins can be forgiven. His mercy. Let's eat. Jesus said this is the cup of the new covenant. And it changes everything. My attitudes, my heart, my actions, the way I live. Let's drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this passage of Scripture is right in the middle of Paul's teaching on how we're to live. And because of where it is, Lord, it's very important. And as a church and as individuals of your church, let us take to heart what Paul challenges us with here and commands us with. And give us wisdom as we live in volatile times in a nation that's in chaos. And help us to be faithful, to be honorable in everyone's sight and they see that honor in the way we live. And it's because of Jesus, it's because of what you have done for us, Jesus, that we do this. And we can't do it in our strength, and we depend upon you to help us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Oh, yes. Stand up. Thank you, Silas. Silas is keeping me in check. <laughs> Let's close with our benediction. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you all. Have a great week.